Welcome to the new Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news and initiatives that focus on the development of cybersecurity economics. You don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert to get plugged in. Your host brings it straightforward, asks the tough questions, and brings the cyber world to a level of understanding for everyone. You can find us on the web at www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join our host as he introduces the topic for today's New Cyber Frontier. Welcome to today's episode of New Cyber Frontier. On today, a great guest. We were just chatting before the show, and I'm excited to get his topic out. But Ted Harrington, the author and number one bestseller in nine different categories, a book called Hackable. There's a tagline. Uh, how to do application security right. That might give everybody a little bit of understanding of what direction we're going. Uh, but Ted, a great, uh, you know, at least direction to come at application security from the prospect of who is breaking them and uh, that that demographic. But Ted, welcome today. Thanks for joining. Totally, man. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, definitely glad to have you. And uh, if I said, how would, how'd you get your start in writing? I mean, you're, you seem like a pretty young guy here. Um, what caused you to be interested in this at first and then go down the path of I can help people or write a book or this is a passion of mine? How'd you get there? I always felt like I had a book in me for sure, but uh, it's funny the way you even just framed that, that I seem maybe younger than what a typical author might be. And uh, I actually agree with you on that because kind of the way I always thought about it for a long time was, you know, later in my life, I'm going to, I'm going to write this book once I have this, you know, decades and decades and decades of experience. And then a couple of years ago, I, I noticed a couple of things happening. First thing I noticed <clears throat> was that excuse me, I noticed that our, we were having the same conversation over and over and over again with our current customers, our prospective customers. And uh, I have a consulting company that advises companies on how to make their software better so that it is less susceptible to getting hacked, we do penetration testing, stuff like that. So as I'm talking to all these companies who need that, that type of help, I noticed that everyone kept saying the same things. Mm -hmm. And it really boiled down to these sort of 10 different categories and not necessarily that everyone had these same 10 problems, but everyone had some of these problems. And I thought that was interesting. And then as I started thinking about, well, what's the solution to those problems? I realized that the conventional solutions, like what everyone is advocating for, not everyone, but what most people are advocating for out in the industry to how to solve those problems was almost 180 degrees wrong. And once I noticed that, once I, I just, I couldn't stand to let that situation last any longer. I mean, here are these people who are building these solutions and they know they have these problems. So they go out trying to solve the problems and the information that they get, the guidance on how to solve those problems is wrong. I'm like that, someone has to change that. And so that was when I, I sat down that day and started outlining the book. And uh, about 17 months later, I had a book in hands to help these people solve these problems. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I guess you've got, you've got some attention. It's a, it's a topic that I think by starting with the word hackable, even if it's applications, you know, the topic is application security, you, you get a different group of people looking at that. Um, so now I would, and, and we started out by saying, okay, you look a little younger. So, I have been in application security for quite a few years and met those seasoned people you're talking about um, that started with COBOL and some of those other languages, Fortran, right? And then they transferred over to C and, and all right, so they've been developing for quite a few years. They know what they're talking about, right? So, and, and you're coming out and saying, well, a lot of that's absolutely wrong. It seems like there's two different demographics here. One, it might be somebody that comes at it from a hacking like yourself and that other generation that might be saying still that, hey, that direction you're coming at it maybe is wrong. We're going to take a break here from our sponsors. I see you getting ready to talk on this one, <laughs> right? We're going to take a break here from our sponsors. We're going to come back and I want you to elaborate on on where you stand on that side because I know that that, that divide exists. 
and I bet you're going to talk about it very heatedly. Be right back. BlockFrame technology offers next-generation blockchain-managed trust and security. Unique non-fungible tokens are used to secure software bills of materials to provide data quality and security for every transaction in your supply chain. Deploy advanced peer-to-peer -peer product security, scale zero trust capability to millions of IoT devices, allow vendor tracking and accountability, and rapidly reset from compromise. Unchangeable, time-sequenced blockchain data provides next-generation security using machine learning trust algorithms and audit analytics. Start securing your supply chain today by contacting BlockFrame at www.blockframetech.com. Welcome back to New Cyber Frontier. On with Ted Harrington, author of Hackable, How to Do Application Security Right. And before the break, he was just about to unload on, on this conversation, but we brought up the issue of, you know, his, his take was he saw 10 areas, people are doing it wrong. The intrinsic knowledge is kind of wrong. And I know that the, the intrinsic knowledge might come back and say, oh no, we, we're not wrong. What's, what's your thoughts on this? Unload on this. Sure. Yeah. So let me first frame what I'm saying here as a productive conversation. This is, I'm not sitting here and saying, oh, uh, you know, all these people are stupid and don't know what they're doing. Um, what I'm, I'm actually empathizing with those people who have been developing systems for a really long time. But the, really the difference is the, the mindset, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's people, as you mentioned, like me and, and my peers who look at systems and say, how can they be broken? And then there's the people who are building those systems. And fundamentally, what's my job, right? My job is to enable innovation. There are people out there trying to solve problems in the world through technology. And my job is to make sure that they can do that and that there aren't attackers out there getting in their way. And so where this disconnect comes from is those people who are trying to do that, they're, my heart goes out to them. I have so much empathy for them because they're working so hard in furtherance of a mission. And they realize, hey, security is something that is important because if we don't do it or we don't do it right, then these malicious forces could get in our way. And so 100% I'm on board with that. The problem lies with the advice that is recirculated about how to solve that. So it's not like, oh, hey, you've been doing this for a really long time and I, um, I have a new viewpoint and you're stupid and you're wrong. That's not it at all. The point is the people who are telling you things like, for example, when you work with a company to help you do your security testing, you know, don't give them any information because they're there to emulate your attacker. That's wrong. That's fundamentally absolutely the wrong way to do it. Yet that type of mindset persists rampantly. It's, it's like everywhere people think that. Mm -hmm. And the person who's caught in the middle of that, the person who's like, well, look, all I wanted to do is solve my problem. That's the person building the system. And so this is almost a... Uh, the, I guess the group that I'm calling to the table to yell at here isn't the people building systems. It's the people who maybe don't understand how attackers think and operate. And, and I don't think they're doing so willfully or maliciously or because they're dumb or they're ignorant. It's because they just don't understand. And I'm bringing this new perspective of like, hey, this is actually how the attacker thinks and operates. And here's how to do it differently. Mm -hmm. So you think, uh, and some of this, I, I hear what, you, what you're saying, it sounds like that you're saying it's the people basically that are saying, here's the project we want you to put together. Here's the app we want you to develop. Um, and we want to, they're money conscious, right? And so security is always a, how little can we get away with type of expense and overall, you know, tax on the businesses, I think you said, uh, is that that demographic you're kind of saying is, you know, maybe it needs to be more accepting of, hey, let me take the people who are trying to break it that we might not have have designed it for, but they're out there and they exist um, and help the people who were paying to develop it with a little bit of uh, of grace in merging the two. I mean, this is the classic challenge of how security fits into a business. And of course, I'm a security guy, right? So I believe that security is the right thing to do. And it's in itself worth doing, like being nice to your, being kind to your neighbor, that mm -hmm. in itself is worth doing. You don't need to be compensated for that. I think that security is like that. You should do it because it's the right thing. Uh, but I'm also a pragmatist. 
I'm a capitalist and I realize that, you know, a business needs to have justification. And so this has always been the challenge. A lot of people think about security as a cost to minimize or as something at, to a bad thing to remove. And that makes it really hard to measure, right? So they look at it and they say, well, we didn't get hacked this year. So how do we measure our return on investment? Were we lucky or were we good? Is, you know, where should we double down? And so what I'm advocating for is that companies actually think about security differently because it's not a cost. And what you, the way you described it is exactly right. Companies all the time, they're thinking about this expense to reduce, right? Okay, we know we have to do security. So what's the smallest dollar amount I can spend that makes everyone stop breathing down my neck? Instead of saying, how can I use security to advance my business? Mm -hmm. And that is the future of what's happening right now. All of the most progressive companies that I see, they see security as a competitive advantage. And the reason it's a competitive advantage is this. Think about the people who buy licenses or subscriptions to software systems. They want those systems to be secure. Mm -hmm. That is an expectation of theirs. So that's one factor that we see. The market wants this. The second factor that we see is that the companies selling those licenses or those subscriptions to them don't know how to do security. And even if they do, don't know how to talk about it. So now take those two together. You've got the marketplace says I want it and then people can't give it to them. That's an enormous, I mean, overwhelming, like generation defining opportunity for companies who do do security right. Mm -hmm. and who do know how to talk about it right now when they go to that buyer and say hey i know security matters to you i've invested it in this way look what i do now compare that to the other three bids that you're getting of my uh competition mm -hmm. you're gonna win that right you're gonna win that game every single time it's an enormous competitive advantage as soon as you understand it's a competitive advantage gotcha so if i'm a company and i have five competitors and we kind of sell a similar product but i differentiate myself because i have better security and I have some way to, to articulate that to my customers. How much of a premium can I ask for my product? Well, that's actually a really good question. I think that you can charge a premium for it. Uh, I haven't thought about quantifying what the premium is. But now that you asked that question, I'm going to noodle on that. And I will, I will write a uh, blog about that question because it's a really good one. But here's how I might ask the question even differently. Instead of it being a premium, think about it as how can this help you close more deals or close them faster? Mm -hmm. Because even if you're not charging a price premium, you keep your pricing strategy exactly the same as it is today. But And you, you already might be the uh, more expensive version in the marketplace, or maybe you're the cheaper version in the marketplace. That's not necessarily the point. The point is when the buyer is comparing supplier A to supplier B, and they're like, oh, these are roughly equivalent price points, you know, some more than others. They have roughly similar features, some of what we want, some don't. But these guys over here, they actually prove to me that they're secure. Not the nonsense that everyone's doing. Not the like, we use bank level encryption and we use military grade security and we are highly secure, but then never actually describe what that means. Or we, you know, we do external penetration testing and then never show anyone anything about what that means. That's what you shouldn't do. The companies who can actually prove their security, like first you have to actually be secure. So once you are secure and then can prove it, that's going to hugely stand out from everyone else who's making those kind of nonsense claims. And so when you can do that, that helps you, whether you want to charge a price premium or not, that helps you close more deals faster. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I think I agree with you and that's why I, I look forward to, to your blog and let me know the link when you, when you post that. Um, but I think that you can't. I don't think people pay a premium for it. That was kind of my trick question to ask you. I think you're exactly right that we might use it as a differentiator, that we have something that can market us better, that helps us get more sales. But I, I don't think there's a market out there that pays for software. So, you know, um, we're going to take a break and hear from the our, our, our sponsors. But when we come back, I want to talk about and expand that a little bit more as to if we can't really offer a premium or get more money for it, what's the value for us to spend on doing it? Be right back. BlockFrame technology offers next generation blockchain managed trust and security. 
Unique non-fungible tokens are used to secure software bills of materials to provide data quality and security for every transaction in your supply chain. Deploy advanced peer-to-peer -peer product security, scale zero trust capability to millions of IoT devices, allow vendor tracking and accountability, and rapidly reset from compromise. Unchangeable, time-sequenced blockchain data provides next-generation security using machine learning trust algorithms and audit analytics. Start securing your supply chain today by contacting BlockFrame at www.blockframetech.com. Welcome back to New Cyber Frontier. On with Ted Harrington, best-selling author of Hackable, How to Do Application Security Right. Um, before the break, we, ta we talked about the what value a security could offer a, cus a company that makes a product that says we want to charge a premium. And I think we, you know, at least that's my opinion that I don't know if Ted will come up with a different one as he does his analysis, that you probably can't offer a premium. Um, there's just not a market for, I'm going to pay more for security. But there's definitely a decision point that says, I might go with this customer because they have this, this product because they have better security. Um, at what value do you see that coming in that would be worth me to spend an investment on it? Is it just an ethical comparison that says people like that are going green or is it a intrinsic value that the company has? Yeah, I think that you, you asked the exact right question because those are the two ways to think about it. Um, so one dog, very good comparison is going green and certainly what anyone who knows anything about home building will tell you is that everyone says, yeah, I want green. I want the eco this and the eco that. But when it comes to paying for it, they are not willing to pay for it. It's just not going to happen. And but I don't think that's the right way to think about security. Security is not like going green. It's not like, oh, this is nice to have. But if you can get the government to subsidize it, then sure. It's not that. Instead, it's more like, does a company have values and does the company live those values? now? What I mean by that is this, think of a company, a lot of companies will say things like, we are defined by integrity. Mm -hmm. We put the customer first. Those are pretty common examples across, I mean, integrity is one of my, uh, our core values as well. Now, for someone who says we put the customer first, but doesn't invest in protecting the customer's assets, how credible, how authentic is that company in living its core values? Not very. If a company says, we believe in integrity and integrity, the definition of is doing the right thing, even when it's the hard thing, even when no one knows you're doing it. Mm -hmm. If they claim that to be a core value, but then don't invest in security, they're at odds with their own core values. Now, take all of that. And I'm, again, I'm a pragmatist, but I'm, I'm an idealist. I believe in those things. Absolutely. But I'm also a pragmatist. And then I realize that, you know, someone, a decision maker listening to this might be like, that's a nice to have. Okay, so now let's talk maybe about where it hurts. Let's talk about how it hits the wallet. So we've already talked about how security done right and communicated effectively can actually help you close more deals faster. Whether or not you can charge a price premium for it, I'm probably in the same boat with you. I wouldn't say there's no market for people who pay a premium, but it's going to be like the security paranoia people like me who will pay a premium, but probably not most people. But Nevertheless, investing in security, one thing it will do, it will help you make money by closing more deals faster. The second thing it will do, if you do it right, it will actually save you money. And this is one of the things that I discuss in my book in a few different ways. And it's not maybe the way that people are thinking. People are thinking like, oh, it saves me money because I don't pay breach expenses. I didn't even touch that in my book. Because I'm like, look, that's been beaten to death. And there's the whole, the whole field of risk talks about that. That's not my point. My point is, if you do security right, you save money in your development expense. You save money in productivity. You save money in terms of how much you pay your outside security consultants because there's a uh, cost-efficient way to do it and there's a cost-inefficient way to do it. And the reason I spent so much emphasis talking about how to help people save money, like I'm in the business of people paying me to help them find vulnerabilities. And there's like, why would I write a book saying, here's how to pay me less? Mm -hmm. because that's ultimately what the buyer needs. Like that's what my customers need. That's what the world needs. And I spent a lot of time in there because people don't realize that decisions they make about how to think about security and when to think about it directly impacts the bottom line. And so 
if someone rejects the idea that security is a reflection of your core values, which I'd encourage you not to reject that, think about how it at least impacts your bottom line. Yeah. You know what? And, and I've seen this in, um, and I, I will make almost a distinction here that, uh, that maybe we're not in the same generation. There's a gap between you and I mm -hmm. in this area where I'm, have seen more of the, the previous generation that might not have the idealistic, yeah, well, let's do it because it's the right thing. It's more of, well, we got away with it for this many years. Now we kind of have to. So how does it impact my bottom dollar? Um, if I get away from let's do it for the right thing, the the equivalent that I can see is it's almost like a quality. So how can you sell now a quality of business? And it sounds like you might have touched on this in your book a little bit of let's take the idealistic, this helps us be better. And now let's put together the ways it helps us be better that makes a quality and sell that. Is that more of a thought process around what you're what you're talking about, what you're articulating? I, I think so. I mean, you use the word be better. I'm literally wearing a t-shirt right now that says be better. Um, <laughs> and that is the this the pursuit of better is the core, the absolute core of all of security. Mm -hmm. Anyone who wants to do security right has that mindset, right? They think, are we better today than we were yesterday? And will we be better tomorrow than we are today? Mm -hmm. And people who do not think that way about security, they're the ones who don't do security right. It's, it's literally that simple. Either you want to get better or you don't want to get better. And when you think about it in that context, so that still is somewhat of an abstract, somewhat of an ideal, like well, we should all want to get better. But like, what if we can make more money by not being better? I think there's probably a lot of people who might hear that idea and, and have that. Thought. What if you could make more money by being better? Do you address that? What if you can make more money? By, and I, I argue that you do, in fact, make more money by being better. And if you think about really, I wouldn't say that everything in the world has gotten better and qualities improved over the last hundred years. I mean, certainly, you know, you look at the quality of maybe certain products that maybe used to be made out of metal and were indestructible and now are made out of plastic and last like, you know, six months or something. Certainly some things have gone in the opposite direction, but so many things in our society are better today than they were like a hundred years ago. And people are willing to pay more for them and are more attached to those brands. And I mean, you look at things like what even just, I don't talk about this in my book. I'm not an expert on like innovation or um, uh, lean processes or anything like this, but Toyota is certainly an example that is commonly referenced as someone who set out, you know, many years ago to say, Hey, let's just build, let's engineer our processes to build the most quality thing we possibly can. And as a result, you know, decades later, they changed the game and the game's changing again now with what Tesla's doing, but Toyota changed the game by focusing on quality and security is directly a measure of quality. You know, you can build, you're already going to build the thing, right? So mm -hmm. why would you not take the moment to say, let's build it right? You could build it or you could build it right. And once you build it right, then it helps you make more money and actually save money by doing it correctly. So uh, are we at the prefaces or past it where like you're, you used the example, a perfect example, I think, in the auto industry where Toyota had defined quality ahead of their comp competitors or competition. Um, and at, at one point, all the competition was losing business and going south at the same time. And everybody had to step up to that Six Sigma quality rating. Are we at the point where the industry and security is getting, meeting that prefaces where certain companies are totally going to stand out and the competition is all going to have to realize that this makes sense? Because I don't, I don't think we got there yet. I think we're still prior to that kind of if you use the example of the Toyota, the quality prefaces, I don't think we're there yet. What do you think? Yeah, I, I would agree with you. We're, we're definitely not there. We are at the beginning of that transformation. And to me, that's actually really exciting. Now, mm -hmm. you know, from my own like corner of the world, uh, because the kind of companies who would hire someone like me, they are all the ones that are the progressive companies that are like, yeah, security is a differentiator. Security is about quality. They're, they're all the ones in that cat. So to me, I'm like, well, everyone I talk to is like that. But I recognize that they are the, the minority in the world. And we're still really far away from the, let's, let me rephrase this differently. The where we are now, people are starting to realize. The awareness is there. They're like, mm -hmm. that security thing feels kind of important. 
and we still don't quite know how to do it. If we fast forward, I don't know what the time frame is going to be, but let's just say, I don't know, 20 years from now, I think we will have a much better handle around the middle of the bell curve understanding security is something that is it's a core business discipline it's the same as like like the ceo is responsible for security the same as the ceo is responsible for marketing and sales and hr and you know all of the other primary disciplines security is one of those things too but only just recently are people starting to realize that mm -hmm. now let me shake it up again here and Let's do it because i i've been around in security for um quite a few years. We won't, I won't date myself, but I probably will with these couple of uh, timelines in the um, I've heard this talk before that security is going to become important. And in a couple of years, it's going to change the game. And the first time was in the late nineties, early two thousands with the trusted computing. But then there was a revolt against it and people looked at it as well, this could change and be negative. It could make that everybody cannot be anonymous every, anymore. And then we had a similar thing on the internet um, through the late 2000s where we had a dip then too. And that was more of a, a loss in importance because of the, the, um, the market kind of dip in the housing market. Security became the first thing that companies could cut. And they did across the board. There was, oh, we'll worry about that later. When, we'll take our vitamins when we have more money. And then it happened again right after the, the Snowden incident, where now all of a sudden there was a ramp up in early 2010, 11, and in 2013, there was this big dip where security became a bad word now because it's about violating people's privacy. And we, I've seen those, those times like you're talking about several times in my career, and then there was a revolt against it where politically it changed. and. That ramp up to this prefaces that was eminent and everybody saw it actually turned to almost like a disdain and, an, and a repulsion. What do you say about are we really at that prefaces where people are going to take this serious now? Well, this is uh, – I'm not a societal expert, but I'm going to give you my societal opinion <laughs> because I think what you – the way you pose the question um, is a really powerful and philosophical way to think about it. Um, but progress is a forward moving swinging of a pendulum, right? What always happens, I mean, any progress in any society, I mean, even just look at politics in America right now, perfect example where it's like what happens is progress, you know, moves forward and then there's a pushback from it and then it, it recedes. And then when it starts to progress again, the forward peak of progress exceeds the prior peak and then it regresses and then it progresses and it, it constantly is swinging back and forth. And that's exactly what the progress of security is like and is going to be like. And you mentioned a number of the sort of pullbacks where people are like, wait a minute, Sec Snowden, great example, where security and privacy now became intertwined. It's like, that's a privacy problem. Uh, that makes me worry about security. I don't like security all of a sudden. And uh, even more recently than that, I think one of the maybe pullbacks has been around encryption. You know, law, law enforcement has saying, you know, we need backdoors and everything so we can catch bad guys. And uh, that statement on its own, sure, sounds really great until you realize, well, once there's a backdoor and everything, there's a backdoor and everything. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that's no one. That's bad. We do not want that. And so, yeah, there's it's not going to be a linear path. It's not like today and then five years from today. It's this perfect linear uh, well, you, you march know, to progress. I agree with you that security hasn't had a linear path in them. The pendulum is a good way to explain what's happening. But at the same time, um, usually technology adoption follows an S curve. So you have a small ramp and then it hits saturation. Um, and the, the major pullbacks that I've seen in, in the security industry, you usually don't see in a lot of technology adoption follows more of that S curve, that gradual, and then finally breaks that prefaces. Um, I, I, I just, I've seen it be a little bit different, but that's kind of my take on it. Just wonder what you thought. Yeah. I think how this is different though, from your typical innovation S curve is that innovation has a, a straightforward business case, right? Pick your innovation, whatever it is. And it's like, here was the problem before. And through this piece of innovation, it's now easier, faster, cheaper, whatever. Whereas security 
it actually requires a rewiring of the way people think. It's counterintuitive and it's often perceived as in conflict with the business, in conflict with user experience. Like it has all of these bad perceptions about it. And until and those need to be overcome, and until those are overcome, then it won't have that sort of in the middle S curve spike that mm -hmm. happens up. And so that's a really an important distinction and why things are kind of like the way that they are. Yeah. Well, I agree. I love this philosophical discussion that we had. Um, <laughs> I think uh, people will definitely, if they're you know looking for your book, we're glad to have you on and talk about that. How could somebody find... Uh, Tell me how somebody could reach out to you, get a hold of you, contact you, what types of people you're looking for, servicing, things like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I wrote this book uh, and also my, you know, my consulting service is for CTOs, VPs of engineering, you know, people who are responsible for the security of software systems. And um, so the, the point is to help people do that better. So I want to be a resource to people who are s addressing these same security challenges. And so, uh, the easiest thing to do, whether you want to talk to me about the book or about our consulting, you want to follow me on LinkedIn, you want to understand more about anything we talk about today, just go to hackablebook.com and all my contact info is there. Information on the book is there. Uh, that's the easiest hackablebook.com. All right. And you heard it here today on new cyber frontier. Thanks for joining Ted. Thank you for having me. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of New Cyber Frontier. Remember to get involved. Often we think that someone else will handle privacy and security in the virtual world, but you are the only one truly in command of your virtual fate. Join our mailing list so we can keep you informed of breaking news and new releases. If you have an idea, if you have a question that you would like to hear answered, or if you want to get involved with our efforts, reach out to us at NewCyberFrontier.com. We also encourage you to visit our sponsors' links as they are the ones that really make this show possible. I want to thank each of you for supporting the show, and we look forward to seeing you back for the next episode of New Cyber Frontier. <laughs>